However, what we care about is that we still want all of these technologies that we have sitting here so we can still use them. So to do this, we had an engineer, Max Brunning, who started up the port in fall, late fall of 2010. He was working hard, and those of you who have never looked at how this virtualization stuff works, it's pretty complicated. We decided to go back to the very beginning of how you even boot and virtualize pretty much everything. So he got to a point where we could actually get up we were spinning in real mode. So real mode is basically the old way that the processor talks back when it was in 8086 that Intel came out in 1970. So your processor still starts up as an old 16-bit <coughs> CPU and then transitions and becomes a 32-bit CPU, then becomes a 64-bit CPU. We actually have to go back and deal with those. So when he got to that point, then Brian Cantrell and myself, we joined on the team and we kind of started working on it. It was basically at a point where it was parallelizable enough that we could actually all kind of work on it and make forward progress. So this culminated in August of 2011 at KBM Forum. We presented, we made everything publicly available. Since our port, we basically had a good point in the port, and we started using it. So this technology, our port of KBM has been in production in Joyent's public cloud since then, and it's been running pretty solid. So we've been happy with it. Um, as part of our port, we focused specifically on Intel processors. This is in part because we only have Intel, and Intel was one of the investors in Joint, so kind of a natural piece there. So it's not out of spite or not of wanting to do AMD, but just business reasons. So the other thing is we only did EPT support. So EPT is the hardware virtualization extensions that came out in the Nehalem generation. This is what basically lets you do memory, basically you have a second set of page tables for doing guests. And this is actually really important because without this, the performance is actually pretty terrible. So, if you think about it, every memory access that a guest would have to do without having these hardware page tables, you actually have to exit the guest more or less and just go back, figure out what the memory actually refers to, load this in, and start up again. So once you have EPT present, then you can actually do this pretty snappily, and you actually have minimized the overhead to be a pretty reasonable number. Um, the community is working on the AM, on AMD port, and they're making some good progress on that. That's being headed by Josh, and Rich Lowe is helping out with that as well. So, some fun little gotchas from our port. So, um, we didn't find any new bugs in KBM, which is a good thing. I mean, that kind of attests to the fact of kind of that it's a solid piece of software. It was well done, it was well engineered from the start. We did find a lot of bugs with ourselves, and so here's kind of some of the, the highlights of that. So, there's a device, the Intel 8254, which is known as the PIG. Um, and while it's not in its original incarnation, it's still sitting there in some form on your motherboard today. And we had a problem where basically the pit is used to drive interrupt timers. So you basically can say, I want something to fire every 10 milliseconds or every 10 microseconds, and it'll basically fire an interrupt. However, both the kernel driver, KVM, and Kimu were both trying to emulate this device. So you had two sources of the pit. So in this case, you had something that was basically supposed to only fire once every 10 milliseconds. It would fire twice or a lot more times than it was supposed to. So you have a get someone who's trying to boot trying to, cal as part of boot, everyone calibrates these timers to understand how they work, and then it just blows up. So you just like, you just, you just can't boot. It's actually, it, it's surprisingly how, it's surprisingly impressive how well buggy hardware, or in this case, thinking you get two copies of the same hardware, will mess up boot. Because we really assume that hardware mostly works. That we program it to fire every 10 milliseconds, but it's only gonna fire every 10 milliseconds. And so, that's kind of a gotcha. Um, Another fun one is that there's a register on the CPU called the GS. This is, it refers to GS, so GS base. Uh, on Linux didn't use this on a per CPU basis. It just had it, just used GS and just kind of kept it everywhere. So it didn't really worry about what the value was there. However, in Illumos, we actually use a per CPU GS base register. So we use this so that the thread that's running has a pointer to its CPU structure. So that's how a thread can say, oh, I like what CPU am I running? Oh, I'm running on CPU too. But what happens is that we actually didn't have this per CPU GS space there, so you would end up having two threads that would be exiting the guest. Both of them were thinking they were on CPU 2. One of them was on CPU 2, and one of them was actually on CPU 10. So when that happens, you don't last long, and you hope that you crash in an elegant way that you can actually unwind your state. And most times, you just crash in horrible and bizarre ways, where it's just like, I have no clue why I'm referring to some memory. I'm just, just doesn't make like this process can't actually be talking about that that memory there. Like it's just 
doesn't make any sense. And the only way you can actually realize is because with the notion of what your current processor was, was entirely off. And the last little fun bit is that, um, so we rolled this out as we were part of our development. We rolled this out on our, on our build machines. I mean, kind of one of the traditional hallmarks that we always had sounds. We basically always rolled out the stuff that we were development builds on our actual physical infrastructure. So that way, we're eating our own dog food early and often. So that way, hopefully, if someone accidentally introduced a bug, which undoubtedly someone would, you would discover it <coughs> before it went to a customer. So in this case, one of the things that we didn't do is we didn't properly restore floating point state. Now you might say, okay, so you know, you're just doing builds, you actually don't use the floating point register as much at all. Uh, the actual way that people implement memcopy these days, so a function which is basically just copying memory around, actually has nothing to do with doing floating point arithmetic, is they actually leverage the wider registers for the FPU. So you actually have them trying to move around this data, and that's just, they just use those registers because they're larger, and thus it can be done in less instructions. The side effect of this is that you're doing these builds, and all of a sudden you just have all these programs, like the compiler crashes, the preprocessor crashes, and you just have all these things where all of a sudden you're just like, all the data is zero. You're just like, why am I mem copying zero? It, it just, you have these most bizarre crashes. It turned out because we didn't actually res properly restore. There's a bit in one of the CPU's registers that basically say, what is the current state of the FPU? And that wasn't being properly handled. So that's just kind of some of the fun little problems. So, so with all that, why, so let's talk about how we're kind of leveraging these facilities we talked about earlier with KVM. So the first thing we want to do is we actually are going to put Kimu and each VM in its own zone. So in this case, Kimu is actually a knit there. And we had created a KVM brand zone to do this. So when you create this new zone, you're not going to have any other services running, no other processes. Actually, there's just Kimu, and that's it. Your NICs aren't even you have virtual NICs there, they're not even plumbed. Um, and there's such a limited set of privileges that when you break out of Kimu, which some people have seen happen with the recent Vert.io, there was a Vert.io issue where you could actually send carefully crafted Vert.io packets, and that would actually cause you to e exploit random code there. And in this case now, you're actually now inside yet another container. So even if you accidentally somehow do break out with a VM into that user land component of it, you're stuck in now yet another container, you have to break out of that. So it just leaves adding another kind of layer of security. And you also get now all of the manageability and all of the kind of the resource controls and quality of service controls that you previously had on zones. And you can do this on a simple per VM basis. And the, the, the Kimu container, it's a non-global non container. Right? Yeah. So yeah, all those would just be in the non, in a, in a local zone, so not in the global zone. So next thing we did is we, combine Kimu with Crossbow. So Kimu has the notion of different networking backends. So you could use a user land networking backend. You could use a tomb tap device. Um, so what we decided to leverage is leverage the local presence of vNIC. So each NIC that the guest has, and those can communicate over vert.io or however methodology they want, corresponds to a vNIC in the host. So what this lets us do is we can actually basically do static uh, IP address assignment. So what we'll do is we'll say, here's a bunch of, here's a NIC that corresponds to the NIC and the guest. We're going to assign it an IP address and a MAC address. And we have a built-in DHCP server, so the guest can just use standard DHCP. You don't have to try and configure it with static IPs and deal with the pain of trying to change those for every single guest that you have. And then it's actually locked into that IP address. So because of that, because of anti-spoof that comes in basically as part of the KVM branded zone, is basically just enabled by default. If you basically have specified these options for DHCP, you actually, the guest actually can't go send out traffic on another, can't claim to have another IP address. You can't claim to have a different MAC address. It's all locked into that. And similarly though, if you actually don't enable the DHCP stuff, so you actually have a traditional DHCP server you want to use, or you want to just assign a static IP address in the guest, and you don't want to use the built-in kind of DHCP server, then you just disable that. And then you just get the MAC anti-spoof Though you don't get the IP address anti spoof because at that point we don't actually know what the, we can't know what IP address that you actually have. The last part of this that's pretty useful is that there's a lot of facilities already in place for understanding what the guest, what a virtual, what a VNIC's like networking throughput is. So you can actually, there's already counters in the operating system, 
And so now you actually have a one-to-one -one correlation with each NIC in the guest into your host on the host. So you can basically, from the host, basically from one command, see all of the traffic and just kind of understand what it is for each guest. So now you don't have to go through and add a monitoring agent to each guest, you know, figure out how that's going to work against Windows and Linux and kind of configure it. You can just do that all actually from the host here to understand that. The, probably the more interesting piece is how we actually leverage ZFS here. So um, each disk that the guest has is backed by a ZVOL in the host. So a ZVOL is just this virtual block device that's basically just another ZFS data set that could have compression, it could have deduplication turned on it. It just, it corresponds to the disk there. So one of the nice things is that you can snapshot these, you can roll them back, and you get to leverage the, all the arc and all the slog, so all, basically doing synchronous for doing synchronous writes. And because of this, we can actually leverage this to actually create a really tight and very quick provisioning process. So <clears throat> if you go through, you basically have some very basic data set. You're going to basically <clears throat> build up, say, a Debian image, which has a bare minimum, kind of a bare minimum package install. You know, maybe just have any actual pack, anything beyond the base system. Basically, is configured though to have maybe in your DHCP, maybe configured to have some other pieces. You can then create a snapshot of this, and that can be used as a golden image in essence. So you can use this for every subsequent provisioning process that you have. So from here, you're basically going to you want to make a new instance. You're basically going to say, I'm going to clone what I already have, and I'm just going to create a new disk based on the size that I need for this guy. So if this guy only needs 10 gigs of space. I'll do that. This guy needs 80 gigs of space. I'll do that. But your golden image can be a nice, kind of tight and small environment. So with this, we actually basically see this usually take less than one minute. So basically from you saying, I want a new guest, you'll spin up a VM, it'll even boot, and then you can ping an SSH into it in usually less than a minute. And this is in part for just, because if Linux has a very fast boot process, and in part because the usual process takes is actually just very quickly. If you're gonna do this with Windows, well, they have to go through Windows activation, and that's its own series of uh, issues. Um, the last little bit is that you can actually now leverage the snapshots in ZFS send and receive to actually do replication and backup. So here's a way you can basically use the built-in utilities of ZFS to snapshot the ZVOL, send it somewhere else, restore it, and you're all set. So the last little bit is, let's talk about KVM kind of meets Detroit. So uh, Kimu 0.14 actually had a patch which added a bunch of dtrace probes for the use of system tap. So we actually went through and let all these up with dtrace. We also added a bunch of probes to KVM itself, including all of the uh, places where you have these trace routines. So basically the old kernel had trace routines. Um, we also added this notion of VM ranks. So that was something where the, there's a virtual machine control structure, it's a kind of a CPU defined thing, which basically says, here's the guest state. So you can actually go in and grab out guest registers. So you can basically say, what's the current instruction pointer in this guest? And you can now use with dtrace and grab out that instruction pointer. And all this can basically be done on a per CPU basis, a per VM basis, uh, per virtual CPU. You can kind of do all the aggregations and you know, just kind of however you want. You can actually do it on a per, um, let's say, you could do it on a per ZVOL basis, you could do it on a per VDIC basis. So it's kind of whatever you really want. It's kind of how you can do it. Oops. So now actually we're going to see dtrace in action. So here's something we can capture. We're basically, you're actually seeing where ext3, ext3 is doing writes to disk. You're just seeing what offset on the disk's logical offset it's actually writing to. So we create a loop where basically are running, you're creating a file that's a couple gigabytes large. Then you're going to cat it, remove it, just repeat that in a loop. So what you have on the x-axis here is seconds. So each tick is one second. On the y-axis, you have what's the actual offset. The color, so whether it's uh, blue or yellow, refers to whether it's a read or a write. And then you can also have the intensity shows how often the operation occurred there. In this case, it's a pretty uniform intensity because what you'd expect is that the disk is going to write to certain offsets in kind of just a regular fashion. So here we actually see that ext3 is doing a rather simple sequential layout of a sequential file, which is actually Pretty good, that's good. That way when you read off disk, it's gonna be sequential. Now if you had other file systems, you might see kind of other interesting patterns there. 